Well, hey, everybody, we continue with our Revelation study today. Thank you again for all of you who are sharing it out, and I really appreciate that. That's helping the channel. Well, let's go ahead and read our passage. It's Revelation 5, 1 through 7. And John writes, Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. Now, do you ever see things kind of in movie scenes, you know, being the director? Well, starting in chapter four, this would make a great movie. We start with a shot far away, and you see this beautiful glowing in the distance. But as you start moving closer, you begin to see that that glowing is coming from God himself. It's his glory emanating from him. Then we take a moment to look at the emerald rainbow encircling the throne, the beauty of that. Then we'd stop to listen to the roaring of the thunder, and we're amazed at the glory and power coming from this scene. Then the camera moves to the cherubim and elders and witness them worshiping their creator. The reverence on their faces move us. I mean, what a scene. You just want to stare and try to take it all in, right? But then something new. We zoom in on a sealed scroll being held by God on the throne. This scroll is obviously important. You watch as heaven looks for one who can open it, but nobody can be found. And you feel the urgency. No, this can't be. This has to be opened. And then the hero. The one who looks like a lamb, and he is worthy. He is able to open the scroll and save the day. Well, I think that's a great plot. But it's not a movie. This is really going to happen, and you're going to be there. But let's see what John sees. The scroll. Look at Revelation 5.1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. This would be a deed or contract. And this was typical of contracts used in the Roman world. The full contract would be written on the inner pages and sealed with seven seals. Then the content of the contract will be described briefly on the outside. All kinds of contracts were consummated this way. Marriage contracts, rental agreements, release of slaves, bonds. These would be sealed with wax. And here it's seven seals. And so what would happen is you'd open one seal, read a bit, until you hit the next seal. You'd break it open, then you would read until the next, and then the next. Now in Revelation 6, we're going to see Christ begin to break these seals. Each seal broken brings a different judgment onto earth. So this is a contract, but this is a very special contract. Most commentators believe this is the title deed to the earth. So this is the inheritance that will be given to Christ. But there's a big difference between this and other title deeds. Most would have a detailed description on what the recipient would inherit. This speaks in detail about how he would regain his rightful inheritance. He will do so by means of divine judgment poured out on the earth. Now, before we move on, we must be careful here. Calling this the title deed of earth can cause some misunderstanding. I've heard teachers say, when Adam sinned, God lost the earth and his authority to rule to Satan. So Jesus had to come and win the world back. But listen, God never lost the world, and God never forfeited his authority to anybody. Psalm 24, 1 says this, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. This is after the fall, and it's before the cross, before Jesus came to earth in his redemptive work. And it shows us that everything still belongs to God. In Job 1, we still see who is in control, right? 
Satan wants to tempt Job, but what does he have to do before he can? He has to go to God and ask permission first. And when God grants that permission, he does it within limits. You can go this far and no further. And so the point is, God never lost control of the earth. So what happened at the fall of Adam? What did his sin do? Well, it definitely gave the devil a foothold in this world and an authority. Adam was given dominion over all the earth. Adam forfeited that to the devil. That's why the devil is called the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He has authority now, but please listen. It is a God-granted authority. God is still in control. Again, we see that in Job 1. And listen, do you have any idea how bad this world would be if Satan could do anything he wanted? Do you realize how bad every believer's life would be if he could do whatever he wanted to us? Praise God he can't. His authority is a granted authority, and God is still firmly in control. He will allow the devil to bother us with boundaries. But here's the thing. Then he will always turn it around for our good, right? Romans 8, 28, all things work for our good. How frustrating to be the devil, right? You have to go to God. You have to ask permission to tempt one of his children. And when it's granted, there are limits put upon it so that we're never tempted beyond our ability, beyond what we can bear. And then you have to sit and watch as God the Father turns everything that you've done around for his children's good. I mean, it would be frustrating to be the devil, right? But as we move into Revelation, we will see as each seal is broken, as divine judgment is poured out on the world, listen, the devil is going to be put in his place until eventually he will be bound for a thousand years. And finally, his fate will be sealed at the great white throne where Satan will bow before Jesus and call him Lord before being cast into the lake of fire for all of eternity. So this scroll, we could say, shows Jesus reversing the curse on earth. Jesus is going to break the seals, pour out the wrath described at each point of this document, and liberate earth from Satan, the demons, and those men and women who followed him. So let's move to our next section, who is worthy to open the book. Look at Revelation 5, 2 through 4. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. So John hears a mighty angel speaking with a loud voice. And what was he looking for? Well, he was looking for somebody who was worthy to open the scroll and break its seals. Now, he didn't ask who was willing. Listen, a lot of people are willing to have power and privilege. I mean, they're willing to give it a go. But he said, who was worthy? Who had the character that was worthy to open the book? And who had the power to carry out what was written in the scroll? And so the angel cries out, but there is no answer. The mighty cherubim by the throne are silent. Michael and Gabriel and the rest of the angels say nothing. The greats who have been resurrected, Abraham, Moses, David, Paul, they say nothing. And look at verse 3. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And this overwhelms John with grief. Verse 4. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Now, weep is a word used to express strong, unrestrained emotion. We could say that John began to sob convulsively. But why would John react this way? Because failure to find a redeemer meant what Satan had done to God's creation would remain forever. Death, sin, damnation, and hell would continue their reign unabated for all of eternity. And Satan would remain the God of this world permanently. That foothold sin gave him would continue. So creation would never be paradise again. John MacArthur Jr. said this, John wept because he wanted to see the world rid of evil, sin, and death. He wanted to see Satan vanquished and God's kingdom established on earth. He wanted to see Israel saved and Christ exalted. John knew that the Messiah had been executed, Jerusalem destroyed, and the Jewish people massacred and scattered. He was well aware that the church faced intense persecution and was infected with sin. Everything seemed, from his perspective, to be going badly. 
Would no one step forward to change this? Was no one going to unroll the scroll and redeem God's creation? But fortunately, John's weeping was premature. There was one found to be worthy. So let's move to the worthy one, Revelation 5, 5 through 7. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. So one of the elders comforts John. Weep no more, behold, and he draws his attention to a new person emerging onto the scene. Look at verse 5. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. So the search went out, and one was found, the glorified, exalted Lord Jesus Christ, described by two of his messianic titles, the lion from the tribe of Judah and the root of David. So let's look at the lion from the tribe of Judah. That title comes out of Jacob's blessing on the tribe of Judah. That's Genesis 49, 8 through 10. Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as a lioness. Who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. So out of Judah would come a lion-like leader, strong and fierce, and that, of course, is Jesus Christ. Well, let's move on to the second messianic title, the root or descendant of David. We see that in Isaiah 11:10. It says this, In that day the root of Jesse, now Jesse is David's father, in that day the root of Jesse who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Jeremiah spoke of this in Jeremiah 33, 15 through 17. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called, The Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. And so, of course, that man was Jesus. But why does this even matter? Because this had to be true for Jesus to be worthy to take the scroll, right? He had to be the rightful king, the one who came out of the tribe of Judah and out of the line of David. Then it adds one more qualification. He has conquered. Conquered what? Well, he conquered or defeated sin. That's Romans 8, 3. He defeated death. That's Hebrews 2, 14 through 15. Then he defeated the combined forces of hell. That's Colossians 2, 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. That's speaking about the cross. So John is viewing this amazing scene. God is on the throne. Glory is emanating from him. There is this beautiful emerald-like rainbow around the throne. The sea of glass is reflecting it all. Adding to it all is the power of the lightning and the thunder coming forth from the throne. Then there is the reverence. The four living creatures and 24 elders continuously worshiping God. But it's interesting, isn't it? With all of this, John's attention is drawn to a lamb. Look at verse 6. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. In the midst of all this, his attention is drawn to a lamb. I like the way Charles Swindoll put it. He says, through tear-filled eyes, now sparkling with renewed hope, John looked for the lion, but instead he saw a lamb. And the message here is this. He could not be the lion of judgment unless he first became the lamb of God. Now, the word John uses for lamb is this. It's a word that would be used for a little lamb, an innocent lamb. The word you would use for a pet lamb. And so it speaks of his gentleness and his willingness to be sacrificed. Isaiah 53 tells us, 
He was as a lamb led to the slaughter, and he did not open his mouth. Remember in our first study of the book of Revelation, we saw that Revelation is a revealing of Jesus Christ. And one thing it reveals about him is this, he is a lamb. It refers to him as a lamb 31 times in this book. But you know what? The Jews of Jesus' day never understood this. They expected their Messiah to come onto the scene like a fierce lion, not like a gentle lamb, one who would powerfully remove the heavy hand of Rome from their neck. They wanted a military, political Messiah who would set up his kingdom and make Israel a mighty nation again. But Jesus didn't come like a lion the first time, did he? Remember what John the Baptist said when he saw him, John 1, The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus was not the Messiah they wanted. Jesus frustrated them because he really had no political aspirations. He showed no interest in setting up any kind of kingdom on earth yet. The kingdom he was interested in was spiritual, existing in the heart of any who would bow to him as Lord. Listen, he would come the second time as a lion, and he will destroy his enemies and all those who say, we will not have you rule over us. And here in Revelation chapter 5, we begin to see that day unfold, the lamb becoming a lion. J. Vernon McGee said this, The Lord Jesus Christ is a lion and a lamb. The lion character refers to his second coming. The lamb character refers to his first coming. The lion is symbolic of his majesty. The lamb is symbolic of his meekness. As a lion, he is a sovereign. As a lamb, he is a savior. As a lion, he is a judge. As a lamb, he is judged. The lion represents the government of God. The lamb represents the grace of God. Now look at what John says as he goes on to describe the lamb. It says he was a lamb standing as though it had been slain. This tells us the wounds he received in his crucifixion were still there, right? I mean, the nail prints in his hands and feet, the gash in his side where the spear entered, perhaps the scars on his head as the crown was being jammed down upon him. So for all of eternity... We are going to see what it took for us to be in heaven with him. God became a man, and the man became a lamb, and the lamb was slain for our sin. Then John goes on to say, this lamb had seven horns. Now, horns in scripture symbolize strength and power, and seven is the number of perfection. So this lamb has complete, absolute power. In other words, he's omnipotent. Then John said, this lamb also has seven eyes. This spoke of Christ's perfect omniscience and complete understanding and knowledge. John says those eyes describe the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now, we saw before that the seven spirits describes the Spirit in all his fullness. So, as the Holy Spirit was sent into the world by Christ to help the church, that's John 16, 7, now he is sent into the world to help in judgment. Here he goes out into all the earth searching for the guilty, unrepentant sinners that will stand before God and be judged. Now that brings us to the conclusion of the question about the scroll. One has been found who is worthy. Now John watches probably with heart pounding. I mean, the elder said he was worthy, but what does the father think? That's the only thing that really counts, right? The elder might think he's worthy, but if the father doesn't, everything is still lost. And so John watches as the lamb, probably now in the appearance of a man, approaches the throne, extends that scarred hand, and sees the father hand the scroll to him. I mean, yes, what that means is heaven says he's worthy, the father says he's worthy. And that's verse 7, look at that, the receiving of the scroll. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. Now take this in. Linger over it. This is the act that changes everything. The act that finishes what began at the cross. The ultimate goal of redemption has now just begun. The paradise that was lost is about to be restored. The rebellion that has scarred the earth is about to be put down. Jesus, the worthy lamb, is about to become the mighty lion, judging those who thought they could rebel against him and win. Here is Psalm 2 in action. Look at Psalm 2, 1 through 6. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together 
against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Now look at this. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Listen, I think right here we're starting to see Psalm 2 be put into action. And there was great joy in heaven at this moment. Watch the reaction. And I'll just read it here. We'll dig into it next week. I mean, heaven erupted in celebration as the king took the scroll. Look at Revelation 5, 8 through 14. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around, and now here it is, Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb be blessing, honor, and glory, and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. Well, what a scene, right? And we're going to be there, and I can't wait. Here is the climax of what Jesus came to earth for. Here is the ultimate rescue. Not only the liberation of mankind, but the liberation of creation. Here is Satan and his demons being put in their place. Here is paradise beginning to be restored. Here is the beginning of Jesus setting up his kingdom on earth. This will all come to its climax in chapter 19 when Jesus returns and defeats the armies that are arrayed against him. Listen, the cross changed everything, right? But this finalizes what the cross began. The one who came as a lamb is now acting like a lion. And as we move through Revelation, we're going to see just how lion-like he is. The liberation that was won at the cross will now be finalized in judgment. What a scene, brothers and sisters, and we are going to see it. Well, let's pray. Well, Father, we do thank you so much that we know that you have set your king on the throne. Lord, we thank you so much. That when we look around at this world and we see the devastation that sin has caused, Lord, when we see the violence, the disease, all of these things that you never planned for earth, but sin brought in, Lord, I thank you that this is not the way it's always going to be. Lord, I thank you that there is coming a day soon when the liberation begins, (laughs) when Jesus Christ begins to open those seals and starts to read that contract, and starts to enact the judgment that is there. Lord, I thank you that earth is going to be paradise again. I thank you that Satan and his demon horde is going to be put in its place. Lord, I can't wait to see what you're going to do. I can't wait to watch my king restore things. Lord, thank you for loving us, Thank you for drawing us to you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for securing us and keeping us. And thank you that we are going to be with you for all of eternity because you have your grip upon us. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. God, thank you for being so gracious to wretches like us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys. Hit the buttons. Help me out, man. Hit those buttons to help us with the YouTube analytics so that we can get the truth out. And please pray for us. Pray for this ministry as we want to get the truth out to everybody we can in every way we can while we still can. 
All right, God bless you guys. I'll see you in the next video.